Tonight on The Fifth Estate, they were smart, they were brash, called product champions, accountants for the rich. I think there was a perception that they'd never get caught. In the U.S., KPMG paid a price for the tax evasion schemes it concocted. The testimony today will disclose a tawdry tale. But in Canada, a different scheme led to a secret deal. KPMG and its clients off the hook. I don't want to go down a path that's going to cause trouble. Do you think there was interference here? Do you think there was political interference? I do believe there was. Tonight, we'll reveal new details about the scheme. They're just going to keep their lips shut tight. How is Canada Revenue Agency going to detect it? About the culture, the cozy relationships, and that secret amnesty deal. Well, maybe this is a case of tax evasion here. Which is a crime. Which is a crime. And for the first time, we'll name some of the well-heeled Canadians who profited. As a tax professor, as a tax lawyer, as a citizen, as a Canadian, I am upset. Vancouver, 1999. The decade of greed may have come and gone, but for many who'd made money or inherited it, the question was still how to protect it. Enter the tax accountant. No longer the gray cipher of generations past. By the 90s, accountants had become players too, aggressively selling deals and schemes to help wealthy people reduce their tax loads. And they were getting rich as well. There were a handful of big international accounting firms, but one in particular had a reputation for being the most aggressive, KPMG, a giant of a company with branches across Canada and around the world. I think there was a, a perception that they'd never get caught, which made the cost-benefit work in their minds. Michael Hammersley spent years working at KPMG in the United States. He remembers the 90s culture well. It wasn't just KPMG, there was a kind of a runaway industry problem. The detriment of uh, breaking the law was basically a slap on the wrist and you could get filthy rich doing it. The competition to sell, to come up with innovative schemes, crossed borders. In June of 99, KPMG's Vancouver office invented one they thought so clever, everyone involved had to sign a promise not to talk about it, including the clients who signed up. The main motivation was saving the tax. This former client signed KPMG's confidentiality clause, which is why he's in shadow. He approached the company for one reason, he says, to keep his money away from the tax man. It was really just as simple as that, is, you know, I don't want to pay tax. You know, have you got something that works. It turns out they did. KPMG called it their offshore company structure, and it was only for the rich. The crux of the deal was that whatever you invested would be called a gift. You were giving money away to a shell company set up for you in the tiny tax haven of the Isle of Man. According to internal company documents, you had to have at least $5 million to get in another 100000 to cover KPMG's fees. As long as your investment was a gift, it couldn't be taxed by the Canada Revenue Agency. So clients had to swear their money was no longer theirs, absolutely and irrevocably. But that's not what this client remembers being told. But, you know, if I'm the CRA, this is a lie. I still have absolute control over my money. Everything else, every bit of piece of paper, everything is window dressing to create the appearance of, I don't have control over this, but in fact, I do. In a statement to the Fifth Estate, KPMG emphatically disputes that claim. Clients were explicitly told that they were giving up control of their assets. And yet the company's own documents undercut that assertion. 
money gifted to the Isle of Man would earn interest untaxed. It could eventually come back to Canada also as a gift and also untaxed. Nobody gives away $20 million to an Isle of Man company and says, hey, uh, I busted my ass for 20 years to make it, but you know what? I'm feeling generous today, so you can have it all. No strings attached. Uh, I don't think so. Not for a hundred grand check that you just wrote to KPMG. So what kind of advantage did that kind of money buy? According to KPMG, plenty. In addition to the big tax break on interest, clients were told their assets would be protected from other taxes as well. They'd also be allowed to circumvent certain Canadian regulations, limits on charitable donations, for instance, even divorce laws. The scheme would be a perfect way to hide from an ex-spouse, according to a legal opinion obtained by KPMG. It was all pretty enticing, and the pressure to sell was intense. Potential clients were identified as targets, accountants sent out across the country to take aim and celebrated with every target they bagged. The shell companies they set up had names like Burham Investments, SKH, CALFAR 43, and GASC, each one hiding from the taxman the true identity of the rich Canadians behind it. They're just going to keep their lips shut tight. How's Canada Revenue Agency going to detect it? If Canada Revenue Agency figured out what the real intention of this vehicle was, it would be a huge red flag. They were just looking for making a lot of money with only privileged clients. Marwa Rizki is a professor of tax at the University of Sherbrooke. We shared with her what we learned about the Isle of Man scheme and the internal documents we'd obtained. I really believe it was a sham. They had no good intention. They were not thinking about public services. They were talking about things like asset protection and how to circumvent uh, Canadian laws around uh, charitable donations, even around Canadian divorce laws. What did you make of that? Well, it shows the uh, intent. That means if they get divorced, they would not pay any alimony to their ex-wife. Here, I think they just forget about all the ethics. And ethics were about to become a big problem for KPMG in the United States. For Michael Hammersley, the Canadian scheme looked and sounded familiar. The nature of the transaction itself, it resonates plenty. It, it's, um, it's exactly the type of behavior that I saw in the U.S. at the time. Some of the specific um, practices that I observed... In 2003, Hammersley turned whistleblower against his employer, testifying about KPMG's U.S.-based schemes. These are lying and deceiving and concealing true facts and really being trying to be taxed on hypothetical transactions that never took place. His allegations, together with others, sparked a criminal investigation into KPMG that was soon followed by a congressional inquiry. The testimony today will disclose a tawdry tale. The powerful Senate Investigative Subcommittee, chaired by the indomitable Carl Levin. The testimony today will also show the lengths to which KPMG went to hide its tax products and its sales efforts from the IRS. Please stand and raise your right hand. KPMG executives were subpoenaed to testify and almost immediately began dissembling. Why not just give us a straightforward answer? I'm trying my best, sir. Why, why isn't that the straightforward answer? Is this a KPMG document? Do you know that much? It, it appears to be, yes, Senator. All right. Have you, I, I've just got to keep asking it. This right. is my last question. Two, two, I may have to ask it two or three more times. Have you encouraged the sale or acceptance of your tax products to potential clients? We, we have encouraged our tax professionals to advise our clients, and we do that uh, and, and have that contact include, with them. Look, I've got to just keep asking this. Did that include encouraging the sale or acceptance of your tax products 
KPMG is a very powerful, wealthy opponent. One of the problems is Elise Bean served as the subcommittee's staff director. For more than a year, she and her team fought KPMG to get access to hundreds of internal company documents. They were very aggressive. They were very non-cooperative. Um, they fought us tooth and nail. When they finally prevailed, they found out why. KPMG had deliberately defied Internal Revenue Service rules to register its tax schemes and simply calculated the risk of getting caught. We found one memo. They figured out they'd have to pay penalties of about $36,000. That was the maximum penalty, and they figured out that their likely revenue from that was $360,000, so 10 times more. So the advice was we shouldn't register this tax, tax product. Emails are uh, God's gift to law enforcement agencies. Mark Everson headed the IRS at the time. The subcommittee's evidence, he says, was dynamite. Anyone who read the exchanges that were made public in the Senate testimony had to be shocked by the brazen way there was a conversation about revenue and had to wonder, if this wasn't criminal, what was? It was criminal. And in 2005, Everson, together with the U.S. Attorney General, made it official. I'm joined today. We simply can't tolerate flagrant abuse of the law and of professional standards by tax professionals, particularly those associated with so-called blue-chip firms like KPMG. Eight former KPMG executives were charged. Three were eventually convicted. And the company would pay nearly half a billion dollars in fines after admitting what it did was fraud. When we come back, Canada takes on KPMG with very different results. It's simply mind-boggling that you could actually get away with this. Become a Fifth Estate Insider and keep up to date with the team you've trusted for more than 40 years. Sign up for the newsletter and get exclusive access to the Fifth Estate. You'll be the first to know about what the team is working on, upcoming stories, Fifth Estate news, and updates on past investigations. Go to cbc.ca slash fifth to sign up and keep up to date with the Fifth Estate. By 2005, KPMG had been charged and top executives convicted for criminal activity in the United States, fraud related to tax avoidance schemes. In Canada, another KPMG scheme had been operating for six years. Wealthy Canadians who told Canada's revenue agency they'd given their money away, year after year using the so-called gift to avoid millions in taxes. This client says KPMG assured him detection was unlikely. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort by the CRA to sort of like, okay, let's really take a look at what's going on here. But in 2012, the CRA stumbled on the truth here in Victoria, BC. A clearly wealthy family, a KPMG client, had reported virtually no income. The CRA's investigation led them to a shell company registered in the Isle of Man. And that eventually led them to Canada's tax court. In court filings, the CRA called the Isle of Man scheme a sham intended to deceive the federal treasury. And it knew the Victoria family couldn't have been the only investor. So the revenue agency went to court again, demanding that KPMG turn over the names of every Canadian who'd invested in the scheme. The judge agreed, turning the demand into a court order. Initially, when we learned about this, we were encouraged. From his living room in Ottawa, Dennis Howlett heads the grassroots lobby group Canadians for Tax Fairness. He'd been trying to get Ottawa to get serious about wealthy tax cheats for years, the CRA's court action gave him hope. The government's actually taking tax haven uh, related tax abuse seriously and going after some of the wealthy individuals 
who are um, you know, using tax havens to hide their money. But then things started to drag. KPMG appealed and the CRA let the court case go dormant. For years it seemed as if nothing was happening on the KPMG file, until last spring, when everyone learned that the CRA had in fact been very busy behind the scenes. An exclusive CBC News investigation. It reveals that the Canada Revenue Agency offered a deal to rich Canadians avoiding taxes through offshore accounts, a deal that let some of the wealthiest people in this country off the hook. The deal was about the Isle of Man scheme. A copy was leaked to CBC producer Harvey Cashor, and it documented what the CRA called its offer. In essence, it was an amnesty. The CRA wouldn't prosecute. In return for payment of taxes owed, the CRA would waive for KPMG clients most of the interest and all of the penalties. The CRA's only stipulation, the deal had to be kept secret. A pretty sweet deal, considering the tax agency didn't know how many KPMG clients were out there, or how much tax they'd managed to avoid paying. Internal documents reveal the government gave a secret sweetheart deal to multi-millionaire tax cheats, with no penalties and even a discount on the interest. Once again, we see there are two sets of rules, one for the wealthy and another one for everyone else. The pressure was now on newly elected Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The deal may have been signed by the previous government, but he'd swept to power promising tax breaks for middle-income Canadians by clamping down on the rich. Wayne Easter is chair of the Parliamentary Finance Committee. He vowed to get to the bottom of the deal, acknowledging Canadians deserved answers. I've got uh, as many calls on this issue as I have on any other because uh, I think Canadians are, uh, are quite frustrated. NDP you know member Guy like, Caron like is the committee's sure, vice chair. We wanted to have details on the scheme because we didn't know exactly how it worked. Uh, and we wanted to have details. And we wanted to know exactly what type of discussions there were between the Canada Review Agency and KPMG. But it wasn't going to be easy. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to appear before this committee. The committee's first witness was Gregory Weed, KPMG partner and former head of the company's global tax office. Just to be clear, I mean, uh, the, the, the tax aspects of this plan, you know, were fully vetted by the firm, by various committees within the firm, and it fully complies with the tax law. And not, and but we wouldn't be drawn on many specifics, citing client confidentiality. As for the secret deal with the CRA, he wouldn't be drawn at all. As I said earlier, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk about any aspect of the, of the settlement because it's uh, subject to settlement privilege. Who were your main contacts with CRA on, this, on this, series, this package? I can't get into, into that particular part of the investigation, unfortunately. The CRA didn't want to get into it either. By now, the CBC had posted a copy of the leaked amnesty offer on its website. And yet even the official whose name appeared on the document refuse to talk about it. I cannot confirm the origin of the document and whether it would be mine but or not. But can you confirm that you signed that letter? No, I cannot, because I do but, not know the source of the document. But, but why? Would we were not getting straight answers. We could not get an answer about the authenticity of the letter. We could not get uh, answers from the Canada Review Agency as to their communications with KPMG. It's simply mind-boggling that you could actually get away with this. And so we asked Chairman Wayne Easter, why did they get away without answering? Um, well, I, I mean, I chaired the committee. Um, I didn't say that, uh, I think there was times I was fairly forceful in saying, and some questions had to be answered. I mean, when people refused to answer the questions, because questions were asked, what do you do as, a, as the chair? Well, one can be, uh, one, one can be more forceful. Uh, I didn't think it was necessary at that point to be more forceful. But if Easter wasn't prepared to be forceful in getting to the facts, there were experts who thought they could help, including Dennis Howlett from Canadians for Tax Fairness and André Leroux, a tax professor from the University of Laval. He'd studied the Isle of Man scheme and had opinions. And what we had seen at the Isle of Man was that just a, a fabrication, something, a setup, 
and it was important for the, the committee there to understand what, was, what had been done. So imagine their surprise the morning they arrived to give their testimony. They were told to wait while the committee met behind closed doors. KPMG had sent the committee a letter warning that to allow the experts to testify would be, quote, fundamentally unfair and improper. It was all about those cases still before the courts. KPMG's lawyers argued that further testimony could prejudice the outcomes. The committee put it to its own legal advisor, who agreed. The committee could still have overruled the lawyers and heard what the witnesses had to say. But in the end, they played it safe. What happened next was almost comical. The experts were called back in, told they could talk about anything they wanted, as long as it didn't include the letters K, P, M, and G. If I believe a, a witness is uh, moving in a direction that, uh, that could have implications on the court case, uh, then I will uh, ask their mic to be cut and, uh, uh, and go to the next question. Dennis Howler tried to find a way around the restriction. I was the recipient of an anonymous phone call in March of 2015 uh, regarding a court case uh, involving an accounting firm that was stalled in court. And I began an investigation. I prefer if you didn't talk on individual cases, even if you don't name them. A frustrated Andre Leroux didn't fare much better. But I don't want to go down a path that's going to cause trouble. Uh, Mr. Chairman, well, I'm just, I was invited to speak about KPMG. Uh, so my speech is, but anyway, I'll, I'll speak generally. What is it that you would have most liked to have said to that committee that you didn't have a chance to say clearly? Well, if there had been, I mean, with immunity, when you cannot be sued for what you say, you could say that, well, maybe this is a case of tax evasion here. Which is a crime. Which is a crime. And if the committee had heard us about all the facts and all the law about it, maybe they would have concluded that there was tax evasion here. But the committee never got the chance. KPMG's letter, it seems, worked. You'll acknowledge that at the very least, the optics don't look particularly good. KPMG sends you a letter, and all of a sudden then, nobody can talk about KPMG afterwards. Uh, look, uh, KPMG can send us uh, all, the, uh, all the letters uh, that, they, that, that they like. Uh, we're not going to be uh, worried about their threats, but what, uh, what I would worry about uh, is uh, when uh, we have legal, legal expertise who has been uh, through uh, this uh, parliamentary uh, process many times uh, and uh, we looked at their advice and we took it. But even that argument doesn't hold up. There have been plenty of government inquiries amid court cases, civil and criminal. For which I have no one to blame but myself. Brian Mulroney testified in one. So did Jean Chrétien. And then there's the case of Mike Duffy. In 2015, criminal charges had been laid against the senator, but there were still calls for the government of the day to investigate. Leading the charge from the opposition benches, none other than Wayne Easter. Will the government conduct a broad inquiry to determine what other government or conservative party expenses were also forced onto the back of the Senate? You yourself, in the House of Commons in April 2015, called on the government to conduct a broad inquiry of the Mike Duffy affair. So if it was okay for the government to conduct a broad inquiry, then, when there was stuff before the court, why was it not okay with, when it came to KPMG? We looked at, uh, uh, at what legal counsel had to say, of what the uh, consequences but, but might you're be the, you're if we you're the representative if we, of the people. You can we, override legal we, counsel. You we, have yes, no we can. High, there's no higher authority yes, than yes, you. Yes, yes, we can. We can. And it would be a great uh, uh, one day wonder or weekly news well, or whatever. Well, it would have been a public but, service in but, which information no, but and But the truth. better public service uh, would be for us not to in any way jeopardize any court case uh, and let the, uh, let the courts make their decision in terms of the issues that are before them. So how did they manage to investigate KPMG in the States? 
Well, in virtually every investigation that our subcommittee did, there was always a criminal or civil proceeding going on at the same time. According to Elise Bean, former staffer to the Senate Investigative Subcommittee, they saw it as their job to get to the truth. And because they did their job, KPMG was held to account. It was tough for the IRS and the Department of Justice to take them on. Um, by bringing forward the facts in a way that they couldn't, by making public what KPMG was doing, we actually raised the visibility of the issues, and I think we gave, um, made it easier for the IRS and the Department of Justice to continue to fight that battle. Back in Canada, though, the opposition felt the Liberals lacked the will. The government really didn't want this to be dragged on. Uh, that's clear to me. Looking back on it now, Guy Caron thinks the whole effort was doomed from the start. Was there a political influence, political intervention? I do believe there were. Uh, was there uh, pressure put on the committee by KPMG? We know that there were, at least through those letters. Could the committee have acted um, with an independent mind? Uh, by using the powers it was given to him, it could. It just chose not to. When we return, the politics of schmoozing, courting the watchdogs. You cannot attend to a private party where you are acting as a judge on the bench. You can't. Like all of the world's big accounting firms, KPMG does more than sell tax advice to the rich. It also advises and sells audit services to businesses and to governments. In Canada, KPMG's contracts with the Liberal government amounted to at least $9 million last year. And before that, there was a long and lucrative history with Stephen Harper's Conservatives. Mr. Harper, thank you very much. I want to thank you for your strong leadership. It was a relationship that sometimes seemed downright chummy. Oh, that's great. At the same time his revenue agency was battling KPMG in court over the Isle of Man tax scheme, there was the Prime Minister being celebrated by, among others, on the right, the head of KPMG Canada's tax division. The following year, KPMG sponsored one of the government's post-budget speeches. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, today we're pleased to host the Minister of Finance, the uh, Honourable Joe Oliver, who will be introduced shortly. That's Elio Luongo again, making nice with the minister, whose budget might have been millions of dollars healthier if not for KPMG's schemes. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In all, KPMG received more than $80 million in contracts from the Conservatives, including one to audit the F-35 fighter jet purchase, as well as the Senate spending accounts. Tax professor Marwa Rizki. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, if in one hand we know that you're promoting tax shelter, you should be banned to be part of any public contract. And it's not just political relationships. Like other accounting firms, KPMG has a long history of courting the very people we rely on to catch tax cheats, officials at Canada's revenue agency. From hiring ex-CRA officers to sponsoring social events at professional conferences to what had been an annual get-together at Ottawa's swanky Rideau Club. Tax companies see an advantage in keeping the watchdogs watered and fed. The former head of KPMG's global tax office doesn't see a problem. I've been in this business for over 30 years and I've met a lot of people from CRA and I can't imagine that a beer and a piece of cheese would, would impact their integrity in one way or whatsoever. I just don't think that that's frankly even fair. But it's not just cheese and it's not just the CRA. Welcome to Madrid. Last September, the site of the tax world's most anticipated event. The International Fiscal Association's annual conference attracts accountants and lawyers and regulators from around the world. It also attracts judges. There is growing resentment against the global tax structure, especially in the context of tax havens. 
By day, the conference is a chance to listen and learn. By night, a chance to get down and party. This year, one of the IFA's main sponsors was KPMG. The company's ads were prominent, including on the conference app. It directed delegates to seminars and to social events. A party at Madrid's famed Prado Museum, a Spanish cultural night at the Plaza de Toros. <laughs> Events paid for in part by KPMG, attended by people who one day could have to decide cases involving the company. As an academic, Professor Rizki attends conferences too. It's a fraternizing she sees there that raises questions. But well, depends where. I mean, if it's in a public forum, then it's open discussion. Yes, it's okay. But never behind closed doors, it's okay. Never. By behind closed doors, do you include things like hospitality and cocktail parties and those kinds of social events? Yes. So what to make then of this? That evening at the Prado Museum, among those drifting out, gift bag in hand, was someone we recognized. His name is Denis Peltier, and he's a judge with the Appeals Court of Canada, the court that hears all tax appeals. Canadian judicial guidelines say judges should do whatever they can to minimize the potential for conflict or even its appearance. When we first asked Peltier's office for comment, they denied he attended any of the conference's social events. When we pointed out we had videotape, the story changed. He had been at the party they conceded, their earlier denial a miscommunication. In any event, they saw nothing wrong, and neither, it seems, did the Canadian Judicial Council, who we later found out had authorized judges to attend the conference. But he wasn't the only judge we saw in Madrid. A few nights later, a privately sponsored party on a terrace described as one of the city's most exclusive. This wasn't a KPMG party, but the law firm that did host it has a connection. Denton's is the name of the firm, and it was a Denton's Canada lawyer who assured KPMG their Isle of Man scheme was legal. Revenue Canada's challenge that the scheme was in fact intended to deceive is now before Canada's tax court. And this man who we filmed leaving the party is tax court justice Randall Bocock. He's not the trial judge, he won't make the ruling, but he is managing the case day to day, which raises the question why he was attending the Denton's party. I think he places himself in a conflict of interest. Why? You cannot attend to a private party where you are acting as a judge on the bench. You can't, because there is an appearance of conflict of interest, even though you probably did not discuss about the case. It's just the fact that there is an appearance of conflict of interest, and you have to avoid that as a judge. We asked Justice Bocock for an explanation, and we heard back from the tax court's chief justice. Bocock did not place himself in a conflict of interest, the chief wrote. The reception was open to all conference participants. When we come back, secrets exposed. Some of the Canadians KPMG fought to protect. It was a tax dodge based on the claim you'd gifted your money offshore. At some point, the gift could come back to Canada, and because it was a gift, it would be tax-free. Developed by the giant accounting firm KPMG in Vancouver 13 years ago, the Isle of Man scheme helped some of this country's richest people avoid taxes for years, protected by a culture of secrecy that this former client was assured was absolute. It, it, it seems that, you know, if you sort of stay below the radar, you're not going to get picked up. Indeed, even after Canada's revenue agency did find out about the scheme, KPMG's executives held strong. 
telling a parliamentary finance committee only the most basic of information. We implemented this plan 16 times, of which 13 are known to the tax authorities. We haven't used one of these plans in almost a decade. Refusing once again to name the Canadian families behind those plans. It is our view that it's our responsibility to keep our clients' affairs private, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Privacy is something they take seriously in the Isle of Man, too, a tiny windswept tax haven in the Irish Sea. It was KPMG's offices here that set up the shell companies that protected the Canadian investments, the wall of silence designed to hold forever. But last year, a crack. Using the island's own corporate registry, a public website, together with search techniques we developed, CBC producers found that crack and pried it open. For the first time, we learned the identities of some of the Canadians involved in some of those strangely named companies. This one is Burham LTD, according to our information connected to the Burt family of Winnipeg. People like candy. They like sweets. Jim Burt and his family are candy kings, owners of the Nutty Club Company, a Winnipeg landmark. I think the sign of our success, if, that, if that's the correct word, is we're still here. When we asked Bert about Burham LTD, he told us KPMG did try to sell him on the Isle of Man scheme, but he didn't buy in. His son, Austin Burt, shows up as a director in Burham Company documents, a coincidence neither Jim nor Austin was prepared to explain. We then looked at a company called SKH Limited and trace that to Ontario manufacturing giant Victor Zen. We look after the customer very well. The pride of Vaughan, Ontario, De Zen is a member of the Order of Canada and a friend to politicians of all stripes. He didn't respond to any of our questions, including why just months after the CRA started investigating KPMG's scheme, SKH was quietly dissolved in the Isle of Man and moved to another tax haven, St. Kitts. The company's new address, identical to a beach resort and casino owned by Victor Zen. And then there's the company called Gask Investments, possibly connected to this man, David Robinson, for decades a senior VP at Rogers Communications in Toronto. You know, we've been working at this for a while, so although we've had some recent successes, they're sort of eight years in the making. He doesn't have the Rogers name, but corporate documents show Robinson is indeed a member of the Rogers family, owners of the largest media empire in the country. We reached out to several Rogers family members who all told us they had nothing to do with the KPMG scheme, and indeed there is no evidence they did. But Robinson is a different story. When we reached out to him, he didn't return any of our calls or emails. And if there's one institution that might have compelled information about KPMG's clients, it was that House of Commons Finance Committee. Opposition members did fight to get names and bring people to testify, but they were overruled. A missed opportunity, says the NDP's Guy Caron. If you don't punish in some way, you're just encouraging others to actually go in the same direction. The system cannot work this way. The committee didn't get named, and it may not have gotten all of the truth either. Remember, KPMG testified their Isle of Man scheme had only been implemented 16 times. And yet we found records for 21 implementations, five more than the company said. When we asked for an explanation, KPMG told us they didn't include the five because they'd never been activated, so there were no tax consequences. But was that KPMG's call to make? Not according to Marwa Rizki. It's very important actually to disclose that type of information. If nothing else, she says the accounts, activated or not, were a clue. Here, we're talking about a tax structure, about the intention to evade tax. The CRA can actually go ahead and investigate these uh, families and see if actually they did something else. And there's another question about what KPMG itself got out of the deal. 
Former head of tax Gregory Weeb was clear. 16 implementations, a $100,000 fee, $1.6 million, period. It was a fixed fee uh, per implementation. It was not a, a, not a contingent fee or whatever. In other words, KPMG did not take a cut of the taxes it helped save. But that seems to be contradicted by documents filed recently in court. One KPMG client claiming they did pay an annual fee based on tax savings, year after year, amounting to hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional payments. In a statement to us, KPMG disputed that, calling it an allegation unproven and saying it stands by the testimony its representatives gave. In the end, the Finance Committee did issue 14 recommendations, but not one of them about KPMG, the Isle of Man scheme, or that secret CRA amnesty. We opened up the issue as broad as I felt uh, we could. Today, the man who promised Canadians he'd get to the bottom of it all still believes there's nothing more his committee could have done. You could have turned it over to the RCMP for an investigation. Why didn't you do that? I don't have the answer why we didn't have it to turn it over to the uh, to the RCMP. The uh, the committee. Uh, uh, I don't even believe there was a suggestion along those uh, lines. There should have been, says Marwa Rizki. She aspires to run politically for the Liberals, but she's not shy about criticizing the way the Liberal government handled this. It's time for a real investigation. And I'm not talking one conduct by the CRA. I think we're past that now. I think maybe it's time to hand the case to the RCMP to have a look. I think there's a lot that needs to be discovered and to make sure that we know everything about the deal. Like the Isle of Man, so much about this story remains shrouded in mystery. According to the CRA, Canadians behind 13 companies took up that promise of amnesty and secrecy. Who are those families? How much tax did they pay? And what about those who haven't come clean? This client told us he lost his money before he could ever invest in KPMG's scheme, so there was never any tax to evade. But he did pay the company's $100,000 administrative fee and he'd like his money back. Today, KPMG says using their current standards, the Isle of Man scheme would never have been approved. But for years, the company made millions marketing it to rich Canadians. So questions remain about them too. Was anyone ever held to account? Was KPMG offered amnesty too? Or are they really the untouchables?